A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. All right, welcome everybody. We're here today with Leon Weishao. Um, Leon uh, is a PhD fellow at the IT University of Copenhagen and a visiting scholar at the School of Law um, of Queen Mary University of London. He researches video game law, particularly the regulation of loot boxes, a quasi gambling monetization mechanic in video games. And I'm going to start, uh, Leon, uh, in a minute by asking you what you, exactly you mean by that. Uh, he's appeared before the Law Commission of England and Wales uh, and submitted policy recommendations to the Spanish, Singaporean, and UK governments. His research has been covered by both mainstream and video game media, including The Guardian, GameIndustry.biz, GameSpy, Eurogamer, and Game Developer, among others. Welcome, Leon, to the show. Yeah! Thank oh, you. Oh, man, I miss... I miss doing this with Andy. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Andy's not here with us today, guys. He had to take care of his mom. Leon, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Uh, all right, let, let's start with the with this uh, loot boxes are a quasi gambling monetization mechanic. All right, can you break break that down for us and obviously focus on um, why is it quasi gambling? And I guess let's start with what is a loot box too, just so that's clear too. Okay, yeah. So a loot box is um, these things in video games that you can open to get randomized rewards. So before you open them, you are not sure exactly where you're going to get. You might have some ideas about, oh, I, I, I'm going to get a weapon, but you're not sure exactly which weapon you're going to get. Um, so there are, I would say, two ways that you can uh, open a loot box. And the first way is to uh, get it through the game, uh, for example, by defeating enemies or uh, completing missions. Uh, we, we don't really care about those um, free loot boxes, at least not as much as we care about the second type, which are these... Um, paid loot boxes, which are what, what, what we would call a monetization mechanic because the player has to spend money to buy them and the video game company gets money as a result of selling it to the player. Um, as to the, uh, the quasi-gambling part, uh, we, we say it's quasi-gambling because uh, gambling is defined in law uh, in very specific ways and also differently in different countries. So uh, loot boxes, uh, or, or rather paid loot boxes, as I just described, are not necessarily gambling in law uh, in most countries. Uh, that's why it's quasi-gambling, because it feels like it conceptually, it sounds like it, uh, and to many players, um, they will see loot boxes as a form of gambling. But in law, it is not necessarily so. So, so let, okay, so let's talk about the gambling part. So the quasi part comes because it's not necessarily recognized by the law. Uh, what are the gambling elements involved here? Okay, um, so and this is oversimplifying the laws of uh, many different countries that, that differ. But I, I will say they're like three. Uh, main things that the law tend to uh, want to think about. The first element uh, basically has to do with whether or not the player or the gambler has invested money into participating uh, in the loot box or in the game or in the gamble. Uh, this so is, if I bought a loot box, I spent some money on it. Yes. So yeah. uh, in most countries, you must have spent a real world money on the loot box before uh, the gambling law would kick in, at least uh, as to the first element. Uh, we, we, we tend to call this first element the, uh, the sit stake element. And then uh, you have the second element, which relates to randomization. So is whatever the player is participating in actually a game of chance? If it is a game of skill, if it's a sport, for example, then the setting element is not satisfied and you're not gambling. Uh, this might be seen as the uh, chance element, and, and then you loot have the boxes have that element of chance. Uh, yes, um, yeah. it, uh, we, we, I think at least I, I would say that if uh, the mechanic doesn't actually involve randomization, then it's not a loot box, and we're right. not really particularly concerned. If the player knows exactly what they're getting, then that's just in-game monetization, uh, in-game purchases, or whatever you want to call it. Um, for the uh, third element, so that relates, and, and this is where countries start to differ a little bit. And this is actually where, uh, in, in, in the case of uh, paid loot boxes, where in most countries, loot boxes cannot be gambling. It's because they cannot satisfy this third element. So this relates to whatever you get out from the loot box. 
whatever you get out of it, can you then sell it on to another player in exchange for real world money? Basically, is the loot box rewards worth real world money?、Uh, in most games,、uh, you cannot. Uh, pass on whatever you've gained、uh, to another player.、Uh, so whatever you've obtained belongs just to you. Or, 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 in fact, if you look at the、uh, end-user licensing agreements, the the item don't actually even belong to you.、Um, but but, but、uh, to put it simply,、uh, basically whatever you get out of the loot box is bound to your account. And in those circumstances,、uh, the law will say that the rewards have no real-world monetary value, and the third element cannot be satisfied, and so it's not gambling. I gotta come back at some point and ask, what if we are doing things with NFTs? But but let's let's build a, let's build our way up to that.、Uh, lots of people have concerns about loot boxes, and、uh, people have called laws that essentially、um, deal with those concerns. So, what are some of the concerns that people have about loot boxes? Um. So I I I would say the main concern is in relation to overspending money,、uh, in the sense that、uh, the the player might be encouraged by these mechanics to have spent more money than、uh, they wanted to initially, or、uh, then perhaps is、uh, appropriate uh, uh, for for their personal circumstances. That is the concern. Um. The other concern would be. Uh, that these mechanics might be somewhat deceptive in the sense that、uh, the player is not necessarily buying, or rather, when the player made the purchasing decision, they might have not made an informed purchasing decision. They might have thought that they were buying something else.、Uh, another point that's been suggested、uh, in the academic literature is that it is possible、uh, that players who buy loot boxes might then、uh, go on to participate more in gambling. Or that people who participate more in gambling and perhaps have issues with gambling would spend more money on loot boxes as well and、uh, have issues there.、Uh, but we don't really have proof at the moment to say whether or not this really goes on. But this is a potential concern. Right. That last was really interesting. Right. So I mean, you know, I've, I've definitely heard of、uh, the concern that the same. Kind of problems that end up getting people in trouble, like gambling gets people in trouble, would come to games through loot boxes.、Uh, but the idea of、um, starting a loot box and then moving to moving to gambling or more serious gambling, if loot boxes are a form of gambling,、um, yeah, that's really interesting, right? So,、um, and then the other way around, that gamblers will come to、um, essentially enter games and try to use those games as maybe maybe for more favorable odds, maybe for、uh, fun. Funner gambling experience, but bring the problems of gambling with them.、Uh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, and I I I think it's of particular concern, at least to policymakers and parents, is that in many of these games, children and quite young children can purchase loot boxes, and so people are probably more concerned because children are involved as compared to just adults in relation to gambling. Where、um, right, yeah. though, you know, gambling is one, you know.、Um, One area where、uh, you know we legislate the hell out of gambling, right? Almost everywhere in the world, right? Really, really. So for adults too, right? This is、uh, it's interesting because this is one thing that、uh, it really is not going to be that kid focused. Though you always know that、um, it's open to kids just as much as it is open to adults. And unlike you know, let's say me playing online poker where there's going to be age verification. Right here, you're not going to have age verification or anything like that, or at least you could, I guess, if、uh, law if laws were set up, right? So、um, let's talk about that. So some countries have essentially tried to respond to these concerns by regulating loot boxes in in a bunch of different ways.、Uh, others, like the United States, where I live, have pretty much left them alone.、Um, can you tell us about some of the approaches that、uh, countries have tried to to take to loot boxes? Yeah, sure.、Um, I I think maybe I'll start from、uh, the countries、uh, that have done the most, and then go down to the countries that have done the least. Or, or do you prefer the other way around?、Um, you know, let's go. Let's go least to most, right? Okay, so, least to most. Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. So I I I, I think in terms of、uh, the countries that have done the least, that would be pretty much actually most countries. Most countries have examined loot boxes、uh, in the context of.、Uh, Their existing gambling law, and like we、uh, talked about earlier, because it does not satisfy the third element in most countries,、uh, it's not gambling, and 
uh, the, the regulation of loot boxes kind of just stop there. They could apply existing consumer protection law, etc., uh, to try to regulate loot boxes a little bit, uh, just to make sure that they're fair and they're transparent. Uh, but generally, nothing is really done in most countries. And that includes, like you said, the United States. Uh, right. Uh, and, and then uh, doing a little bit more, you have China, uh, uh, which has imposed as law a requirement that game companies must disclose the probabilities of getting uh, individual randomized rewards from loot boxes. So companies have to tell you uh, there is a whatever percentage chance of getting whatever item. For example, a 10% chance of getting this particular weapon. Yeah, so that, that's like a, a little bit of a, a intervention. It, it, it tries to inform the players so that they can make a perhaps a better uh, purchasing decision, but it doesn't really restrict the player's ability to purchase loot boxes. Um, you also have this measure imposed as uh, industry self-regulation in other countries. For example, in the United States as well, you have the situation where Apple, uh, Google, and the major hardware providers saying that if you want to put a game onto our platform, then and you implement loot boxes in your video game, then you need to make uh, probability disclosures. But what we have found is that uh, when this is required by uh, industry self-regulation, as compared to the law, uh, fewer companies comply. Uh, in, in the UK... So, wait, so, so to come back on that, does that mean so... So, wait, so uh, which companies were this? This was Apple, Google... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so so it it was uh, spearheaded by the uh, Entertainment Software Association, uh, the ESA, and it has got the uh, the major hardware providers, so uh, Nintendo, Microsoft, and uh, Sony, uh, to require it if uh, a, a company wants to put a game onto their hardware. And I think the major publishers also signed on to this, so they would say that if you want to publish with us, you also need to uh, comply and disclose probabilities. I have not seen yet this in my app and my Xbox, <laughs> right? Ah. Uh, all right. Uh, should I be seeing if I if I'm playing a, a game on my Xbox? Uh, should I be seeing these or the yes. around and maybe I have not noticed them? <laughs> uh, to my understanding, yes. So if you play a, a video game on the Xbox, that's uh, that, that's not from a, a very old uh, game. If it's an online game with loot boxes, I would imagine uh, it, it would be quite recently updated. In, in which case, yes, you should uh, see a probability disclosure. But uh, I, I think it's more likely that it is there, but that you just haven't found it, which is actually what we found to be the problem with both the Chinese law and the industry self-regulation, is that you know, companies complied largely by disclosing probabilities, but they've done so in quite poor ways. So that we have the situation where many players, we, we, we think, uh, can't actually find this, the disclosure, even though it's been made, just like you, perhaps. Intentionally or unintentionally uh, would be your guess. I mean, obviously, it, it, this, was a, this is a guess, right? Yes, it, it, it's yeah. a guess, but I, I, I would say some actions are probably unintentional. Some, but, 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 but some, um, we, we had in, in this one game where you had to contact the customer support bot and ask it a very specific question about probability disclosures before it will actually tell you what, what the odds are. But in other games, we do have the percentages just automatically shown next to where you would uh, tap the purchase button. So. I, I think in some cases it, it was probably intentional to try to uh, keep it uh, uh, hidden uh, as much as they could. Technically there, but not as helpful as it could be. Right. Uh, I guess one thing to add to, by the way, that the, before we move on to the yes. the, chi the China case. So the China case, um, in the case of China, they ma mandate uh, that you state the probabilities, but they also add the there's a limit to the amount of money you can spend if you're a minor. So at least as far as uh, the kids part go, right, there's a monthly or daily limit uh, to how much they can monetize using, well, using anything really, <laughs> but including loot boxes. Yes, yes. The, the monetary spending limit on uh, uh, children that has been imposed in China uh, relates to spending of any kind in video games. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a measure that's targeted specifically at loot boxes, but it does provide a bit more consumer protection in relation to loot boxes, uh, probably, uh, yeah, just as a consequence. Okay, um, and so now we're moving up. We got China in there. Who has stronger or has tried stronger re regulations? I think w we are basically moving straight up to the uh, countries that have uh, restricted uh, 
certain implementations of loot boxes. Uh, we've we've jumped quite a lot. There, there there are other measures in between, just showing probability disclosures and removing the ability to purchase loot boxes. But those options haven't really been explored by uh, any countries. So we're jumping straight up. So jumping straight up. Uh, so just next to banning them completely, we had the old. Uh, position in the Netherlands. Now, this position has since been overruled by the Dutch court, but it was in effect for a few years uh, before the uh, start of uh, before um, early this year, basically. So, in the Netherlands, you had the situation where yes, gambling law uh, was uh, more or less the same uh, as in most other countries uh, in relation to the third element. But uh, the uh, Dutch gambling regulator was a lot more active with enforcing the law in relation to the few loot boxes that did actually satisfy element three and so did have rewards that had monetary value. Now, specifically, the uh, case was against uh, electronic arts uh, loot boxes or player packs in the uh, FIFA games. And a fine was actually imposed on electronic arts because in the FIFA games, you were able to transfer the players that you got from the loot box to other players. And so it was possible, uh, not within the game, but external to the game to have a, another tr separate transaction where real money passes hands was inside the game, the players uh, would transfer hands. Right. So the, uh, the Dutch gambling regulator said, well, that um, satisfies element three and we're going to enforce the law. But uh, the, uh, I, I would emphasize here that the uh, Dutch law position, uh, the old one, has been overturned by the court. Why? Well, the, the decision of the court is actually uh, uh, quite interesting. But basically, the court decided that uh, um, when you consider whether or not a, video, a, a loot box in a video game is gambling, you don't consider that question yet. You, you have to first consider whether or not uh, this loot box is a game that is so separate from the video game that contains it that it is capable of being examined alone as to whether or not it's gambling. It, it is, uh, I, I think, fair to say that it is a very technical legal point. Um, but 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 yes. Yeah, I'm not sure I got that. So so you're saying that the that the the loot box has to be a separate gambling element that's separate from the game to count as true gambling, and if it's part of a whole game, then the context of a game makes it so it's not really gambling because it's used for some other purpose. Yes, basically. So the court decided that they are not uh, even going to think about whether one of the loot boxes constitute gambling uh, uh, until they are satisfied about something else. And that something else is that whether or not those loot boxes are sufficiently separated from the video game. So they would want, uh, to our reading of the judgment, a majority of players to play this video game solely or mostly for the purposes of engaging with the loot box. That's that's interesting, right? Because um, you know, there's legal standards and there's kind of moral reasoning that usually underlies them, right? So uh, in this case, right, uh, in a game like FIFA, I might be worried. Let's say that some people are going to come in specifically to gamble on those loot boxes and um, maybe try to make money, which I'm assuming is rather hopeless. Uh, you know, selling um, you know selling the cards they have. Uh, or particularly ignore the rest of the game and just just do that. Is the concern that that's just not really going to happen uh, because um, the odds are not good enough? Let's say so. Let's say if I had a you know a situation where it did make sense as a gambler to go into the game, uh, manipulate uh, the loot boxes, sell those items, and I could the chances of making money are greater than let's say you know playing uh, you know a roulette. Right. Yes. I'm assuming, you know, Electronic Arts is not going to give me odds like that. Uh, but let's say they did. Right. Is is that really kind of the concern that the game really becomes mostly people coming in and trying to use it for gambling instead of just some? <laughs> uh, yes. So our understanding is that the Dutch court uh, will only act if it was as you described, if the game was basically played just for its gambling aspect. Uh, in general, if it is a video game that is played as a video game, then the court will uh, simply decide whether or not the entire video game constitutes a game of chance or a gambling activity. And of course, 
it is a video game at the end of the day. It's a simulated football video game. And so, no, it, I, I think it's... Uh, it's reasonable to accept that the entire game is not a gambling activity, but the the court's decision not to specifically examine the loot boxes as to whether or not they individually constitute gambling, that is a, a very unique position that no other country has really taken. So, so just to so let's say uh, FIFA also instituted literally slot machines uh, in the game. Right, uh, and it's showing you a slot machine. You're you're spending in you know in in game uh, currency on those slot machines. You're getting items that then you can you can sell. Uh, that still would not count as gambling. I uh, mind you. I mean, we're taking a loot box and we're converting it to what seems more obviously like gambling. Right. Yes. Uh, let's say in the game you could actually bet on matches in the game. Right. Let's say that was also a possibility. And in return, you would get items that you can then sell in the real world as long as those things, because those things seem like very obviously gambling to me, but they still wouldn't meet the legal definition of gambling, according to the Dutch, if most players were not doing that. According to my understanding of the judgment, yes. It, it, it seems okay. rather hard to believe, but that right. does seem to be uh, the case. But, but of course, that, that is me as, uh, as, as someone with an English common law background trying to understand Dutch continental law. Um, so I could be wrong. Either way, the idea is interesting of where do we draw the line and the, judge, the Dutch way of doing it is an interesting way of thinking about it. So either way, I'm interested. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, it, it, it is interesting. But I, I think most players uh, probably found the arguments that the court made and convincing. Uh, let's just put it that way. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we're moving on from... Wait, so this is... Right, so we had an old law and now that law is overturned. Yes. Um, are the Netherlands now essentially... Do they have no laws on this? Um, yes, I think if we follow the judgment from earlier this year, then yes, uh, loot boxes are... Uh, are, are, you, you can get away with uh, loot boxes uh, in the Netherlands, uh, e even the implementations that technically satisfy element three. But the interesting thing about the, uh, the the Netherlands' old position was that it specifically sought to regulate um, the uh, loot boxes that do constitute gambling and the existing law. So those loot boxes that contained rewards with real world monetary value, those were restricted. Uh, right. in the Netherlands, uh, when uh, in, in the UK, for example, where, in my opinion, the law is actually the same and uh, the e EA should have been liable for a, a similar penalty, uh, uh, the, the, the same sort of enforcement action hasn't really been taken just specifically against those types of loot boxes. So you're bringing in the UK, so we've we're, are we still going up? Yes, we can still go one, one step further. Okay, let's go, let's go the next step further. Okay, so the so so the so the top, um, the the very very top is uh, Belgium. So in in Belgium, the uh, the gambling law is drafted differently from uh, in other countries. So in relation to element three, uh, Belgian gambling law does not require that the loot box rewards must have real world monetary value for the loot box to constitute gambling under Belgian law. Instead, what is required is that the player experiences some sort of gain or loss that is not necessarily monetary. And so you have the very unique situation in Belgium where any loot boxes that require the player to pay real world money to buy and is randomized would uh, satisfy a uh, gambling law and be regulated as gambling. You, you know, to me, when I think about the concerns that people have, right, um, I think about gambling addiction. You know, I play Class Royale, right, uh, which has loot boxes. And, you know, I can easily see myself start buying more and more and more loot boxes, right? Um, not because I'm going to make money, but because I'm hooked on the, you know, on the, um, uh, on the way the game keeps wanting me to level up, right? Um, the harm for me is essentially the same. It's more like the benefit is, is different. Uh, so to me, just off the bat, the Belgian... Uh, law seems to be, now the law was not made with obviously games or loot boxes in mind, right? So I don't know how it applies in other spheres, and um, I don't know when governments think about these laws, they obviously have to think beyond games too. Um, but it seems to me that that law speaks a lot more to the concerns that people have ab about uh, loot boxes. 
Yeah, no, I I think perhaps the uh, the Belgian legal definition of gambling corresponds more with how uh, most players would understand gambling. We we do have surveys that have been ran uh, on our Western video game players, asking them, do you consider loot boxes to be a form of gambling? And you know, there was no uh, specification that these must be loot boxes that contain rewards that are worth real world money. Just generally, loot boxes. This is as a mechanic. Most players, I think 80 some percent of players, thought that they would uh, view them as a form of gambling. So, yes, I, I think you, you're right that uh, in the minds of most people, uh, the Belgian illegal definition is closer to the uh, colloquial definition, perhaps. Is there a discussion in these other countries? Uh, and you've looked at quite a few uh, when you've talked to Singapore, Spain, uh, and the UK. Um, are they considering switching to something? Is anyone considering switching to something like the Belgian? definition uh so the uh, the uk had uh, closed a, a call for evidence or a consultation uh about ooh, uh two years ago now and they recently uh, responded with uh, the government's uh, views on what they would now do about loot boxes and the short answer is they specifically considered the possibility of changing the definition of gambling and they have decided against doing so uh, the reasons that were given uh, were uh, I, I will say the, the first main one is uh, if the definition for gambling is changed, a lot of other things beyond loot boxes would suddenly become gambling and that would be quite difficult uh, to manage. Um, like what? And, so I, I figured there might be something like that, right? So uh, yeah, like what? what? What else would count? Are we, we're making the definition of gambling too broad then. Uh, what, what would be included? See, that, that's the thing. See, see, I, I, now, now that you ask me exactly what this is, I, I am struggling to come up with an exact example. Um, but something that you have to pay money for, uh, that is randomized, uh, but that doesn't give you uh, any value. Uh, our previous episode, we, we were talking with Mark Johnson about the uh, growing uh, gamblification uh, in video games. And we were talking about how games have a really big spectrum of gambling activities and you know we got all the way down to something like uh playing skee-ball uh do you know what skee-ball is i don't think it, i do it's it's <laughs> I'm a too game, young to know you know it's it's a game that's really common in arcades so you know if i take my son to any arcade um they'll have like you throw the ball and it kind of rolls and then it jumps into different kind of buckets where you you know it takes skill you can aim um, and depending on the score, you it's been around for, God, I don't know how long, a very, very long time. Uh, and you get tickets. So, um, you know, there's lots and lots of uh, arcade games. I mean, there's literally big wheels that are gambling wheels. You get number of tickets based on the, on the uh, you know, you put in your, your, your token or whatever, and you're going to get, let's say, five to 100 tickets. And, you know, then, you're, you know, I do this with my kid. Right. So then, you know, you take your kid, your kid wants all these tickets. Your kid is playing these games no longer now for the enjoyment of the games, but it's all about how many tickets they could get. And then they take them up and they get their stupid little prize. Right. Now, notice, right, uh, under the definition of Belgium, right, uh, is that gambling? Uh, yes, it would be. And and actually, the, the funny thing is, um, in the UK as well, even even with the, the existing definition where it says that the, the prizes need to be worth real world money, those things would also be gambling. In, in the UK, uh, the, right. uh, the, 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 the machines in the uh, uh, amusement arcades and whatnot are, are quite heavily regulated. There are, there are spe specific categories and uh, there are specific ways that they have to pay out. Um, really? Yeah, so oh, like okay. the, uh, the, the claw machine, for example, it seems right. like a game of skill. But actually, it is programmed to automatically drop it uh, a set percentage of the time. Uh, oh, wow. I got to say, as uh, it's good to hear it now before I waste any more money on that damn thing. <laughs> but they literally program it. Okay, yeah. Wow. Okay. So that is definitely they're programmed to fail. Uh, it's not a game of skill. That's a game of chance. So you're just uh, you're the lucky one that uh, out of the one out of 100 time, let's say they made it succeed. I can't say that all of them are definitely rigged, but uh, the, the understanding is uh, quite a lot of them, uh, especially in the UK, they, they, they're regulated and they have to uh, uh, do certain things. So then they do count as gambling in the UK? It, it's, they're in a very unique position in the sense that uh, 
they, they are part of gambling legislation. They, they, they are part of the gambling legislation that say, oh, this particular machine is a category D machine. And then in relation to this category D machine, you need to have a license and wh whatever the licensing conditions are. And also the, this machine, uh, uh, the most amount of money that you can take every time a player plays is this amount, etc. So, so there are rules, but it's, it, it's still not really sort of in the main uh, and traditional uh, gambling definitions i would say but but this is i think at least worth to point out right that you can that you don't need to paint everything with a broad with a really broad brush right uh that you can essentially draw distinctions between uh various types of things that would still count as gambling uh and say look this is very low stakes this has the uh, additional benefit of being fun for kids or or what have you um you can do it but you can't let's say make it you know, you can't make the prices Rolex watches or, you know, for, you know, uh, and you can't, you know, charge a hundred dollars per claw. Right. So that's that's kind of one way to still make it available, but to regulate it and as, as as well in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Is this is this also a possibility for loot boxes to kind of fall into something like that? Yeah, I, I, I definitely uh, think that it is possible to uh, design loot boxes in such a way that they are uh, slightly safer uh, than they are now. Uh, you have the situation now where uh, with many loot boxes, uh, you can buy uh, as many of them as you want uh, to, to try to get uh, the, the rare item that, that you're after. But uh, it is possible, and some games are increasingly starting to do this, where if you spend a certain amount of money, if you have bought a predetermined number of loot boxes already, and you haven't gotten a nice rare item, then the game will guarantee giving you one at a, a, a certain a set point in time. So for example, after you buy 10 loot boxes, you are guaranteed to get a rare reward if you haven't got one in, in the previous nine attempts. Do they... So we're going back to kind of disclosing probabilities, right? Yes. Do they do they tell you this, or is this? Um, so they're not forced by law to do this, right? I'm assuming this is to make sure the players don't get too aggravated. Yeah, well, well, see that that's interesting. Now, now, I I would say the law would actually require you to do this because if you don't do this, you are being somewhat misleading as to what the uh, probabilities are, because. Uh, you can have the situation where uh, a game has made uh, a probability disclosure. For example, it has said that uh, there is a normally a 10% chance of you getting the rare item. But if there is an additional rule saying that if you do not get that item after nine, uh, uh, nine attempts and you are guaranteed to get it on the 10th attempt, then technically the probability of getting it uh, is not 10% on the 10th right. time that you do try it. So the probability disclosure actually becomes false on that attempt and unless you constantly right. update your probability disclosure. Uh, and this has to do with the consumer protection law and all of those things that they try to ensure that the uh, consumer is making an informed decision is not being lied to. Right. So, so wherever it is that they have these uh, probability disclosures, uh, you can't... You you can't make them wrong, whether it's for the benefit of the player or against the the player, right? Uh, either way, uh, it's still gonna be covered by it. Um, yeah, that's 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 interesting, right? How you know it's interesting how much you got me thinking now about claw machine, as a as a metaphor for this because it really works. Like I can I can you know I can I can gain a lot from thinking about that as as a you know as potential gambling. Let's talk now about. Uh, how well have these regulatory efforts worked? So we have a bunch of uh, attempts to try to do this. What what's worked? What what's not worked? Right. Okay. Uh, I, I think I, I, I touched on this a, a bit earlier in relation to the probability disclosures where we had the situation. So in China, uh, we found, we, we looked at the uh, 100 highest grossing uh, Chinese games at the time on the iPhone. And we found that 95.6% uh, of those that did contain loot boxes uh, disclosed probabilities. So that means pretty much every company seems to have disclosed probabilities. But, this, but the problem that we had was most of these uh, uh, games, although they disclosed probabilities, they didn't do so in a way that is very prominent or uh, easily accessible. So uh, I, I, I talked earlier about the situation where you had to uh, contact the uh, customer right. support bot. We also had situations where you had to follow multiple hyperlinks and go through multiple pages before you were eventually... Uh, 
taken to the page with the probability disclosure. So technically, you can access them. Technically, the game complied with the law, but um, practically, it's not the best way of doing it. So that seems like an easy fix. And I mean, mind you, this, this is a practical, at least practically, it seems to me that there's two kind of issues here. Um, you know, number one, there's ambiguity about what it would mean if you required them to be prominent, right? And number two, you can require them to be prominent, <laughs> right? So you th that would get rid of, um, you know, of these ways to kind of get around them, though, though we would need to be very clear about what prominent means, and that would involve, you know, thinking that through in terms of user interface and, and all that stuff. Uh, but then there's also the other part of this, which is enforcement. What's enforcement of this like? What you know? What really happens if I don't do it? Are there people who are actually checking up on me? Um, so uh, in in China, uh, when the uh, regulation was first imposed, uh, there was a, a a penalty that was attached uh, to if you did not comply, and there were uh, consumer protection agencies that were quasi governmental, who I think uh, would have been uh, going after. Uh, these companies and we had reports of these agencies looking into these issues but to my knowledge there hasn't been a a, a fine that's been given or at least not one that has been a reported specifically about loot box probability disclosures and and china probably takes this stuff as seriously as anywhere else uh i, yeah, I would well, think yeah, which is probably why just generally there, there, there was that 95.6 uh, very high compliance rate right right yeah so it, it just on this enforcement point, it, you know, if we think about uh, when this measure, the same measure is imposed as industry self-regulation. So we looked at the situation on the uh, Apple App Store in the UK, where probability disclosures were also required, uh, the, the, more or less the same rule as in China. But instead of it being required by law and regulation, it was required by industry self-regulation. We found that only 64% um, of the games that contain loot boxes disclose probability Probabilities. So now 64% is a lot lower than a 95.6%. And w w one, one reason that uh, might have been lower was uh, probably because Apple didn't seem to be doing anything uh, to a game that did not disclose probabilities. Um, you, you know, th th there are ways potentially to, to uh, give Apple more enforcement powers. For example, you know, Apple could uh, re remove those games from the App Store. And Apple could even say, uh, because you didn't disclose probabilities, uh, the money that you earned last, m last month, we're going to keep until you make probability disclosures. There are things that Apple could do, but it seems like Apple isn't doing them. There's no uh, enforcement. Yeah, it's interesting. So it's a nice it's a nice PR move for them to say, you know, we are asking for a safer space, uh, you know, where uh, games won't create, uh, you know, gamblers. But uh, if we have to give up money for that, which is, I mean, enforcement costs money, right? Uh, if the government's doing it, they're doing it in the name of the public good and they're spending taxpayers' money. Um, you know, uh, if a company's doing it, they're just losing money. And what they get is a better reputation. But if they can get enough of a reputation by saying it's happening. By the way, I so going back to Clash Royale. So my Clash Royale game doesn't tell me anything uh, about odds as far as I know. I wonder if I wonder if it does in the UK. Um, I am pretty sure that the, the, the US version that you'd be playing uh, would be mm, the same as the UK version. Because Apple would also require this in the US. Apple would require it anywhere in the world, uh, basically. Oh, I see. So, in, in relation to Clash Royale, because we actually looked into that particular game, so they have a, a probability disclosure on their website. On the website. On the okay. website, yes. Um, so why would I ever go to the website? I mean, exactly. The app, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, there are also benefits to a website disclosure. You, you know, I, I, there there are two ways, two locations mainly where you can make a probability disclosure. Once in game, once on the official website. And I think in-game is a lot helpful, a lot more helpful for players. But also website disclosures, they're not necessarily redundant because 
parents, for example, they might not want to actually play the game,、mm. uh, and get get through all the tutorials and whatnot, and then finally go and see the probability dis- disclosure. They might want to just Google it and find it on the website. So there are also benefits to a website disclosure, but you should be doing both rather than just one. And to my understanding, if I remember correctly, with Clash Royale, I think you can get to the probability dis- disclosure from in-game. So you click on the chess icon, and then there is a little tiny I button that you click on, and then you'll say, "Oh." Would you like to visit the website? And I'm like, oh yes, I will visit the website, and then it takes you there eventually. But, but this is、right. why we were saying about how it takes so long to, for you to actually get there. It's、right. perhaps just there to dissuade players from actually accessing it.、Uh, okay, so let's let let's move move on from this.、Um, so so at this time we got a lack of effectiveness for this sort of law where you're you have to state the probabilities.、Um, we have a.、Uh, Is Belgium's laws effective? Is is that、uh, is it working? Because 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 the the Dutch law and was the Dutch law effective while it was in place?、Uh, so we we、uh, well, I didn't get a chance to look at the、uh, situation in the Netherlands before it changed,、um, so I, I I couldn't really comment on that.、Uh, but I, as far as I'm aware of,、uh, the only enforcement action that was taken was against EA. But I personally know of examples of other games that that had loot boxes with rewards that are worth real world money that didn't get an enforcement action against them in the Netherlands. So perhaps even there, the enforcement action was not uh, 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 as good as、uh, one might hope. But I, I did、uh, go to Belgium early this year to look at whether or not their ban has been effective. So again, I, I went and looked at the one、uh, hundred. Highest grossing games on the iPhone now, because the law applies, and be- because the law says you need a gambling license before you are allowed to offer paid loot boxes of any kind in Belgium.、Um, The situation is that the Belgian gambling regulator is not actually empowered to grant a license for offering loot boxes in video games. That is a category that it is not empowered to license,、oh. and so. So yes, so the, the the situation is no video game company could possibly have a gambling license. I see. So is it the issue that that means any game that actually has loot boxes is going to count as gambling? In which case, it's going to have to go through the regular gambling commission, or is、yes. it that it wouldn't? Okay, yes. And、yep. just no games have done that because the gambling commission is not built for video games, or it's just not worth the, the hassle. Belgium is a, is doesn't have you know a terrible you know terribly large、uh, population. Is this just not worth it for game companies? Uh, so as it stands, the the gambling law in Belgium has set out、uh, specific categories of、uh, licenses、uh, that the、uh, gambling regulator can grant, and loot boxes in video games it does not fall under any of those categories. So as、oh. gambling law in Belgium stands,、uh, the regulator cannot grant a license at all for this particular type of gambling. Even though it's gambling, it cannot be licensed, and so in all cases, it would be illegal. I'm assuming this was mentioned by video game companies that you are passing a law that literally makes it impossible for us to do anything. You're saying we're you're saying we're gambling, but you're not allowing us to actually file as gambling. Was this a reason that was presented for getting rid of the law? Um, I I I would say that that would be a potential argument for removing the law, but but the thing is that this law. Uh, I, I think was last amended、uh, in the 1990s. So、oh. th- this law w- was not law that was brought in to regulate loot boxes. It was old gambling、right. law intended to regulate traditional gambling. It just so happened that loot boxes、uh, fell within its ambit, and and it was recognised in the uh, reports uh, that the、uh, Belgian gambling regulator、uh, produced. It, it did say yes, we are actually not in power to license this. So the situation in Belgium is that paid loot boxes are banned not only for purchase by children but also by all adults. Right. Literally, no one is allowed to buy a loot box in Belgium. Right. So I'm allowed to, you know, let's say potentially、uh, bet on sports teams, or bet、yes. on the track, or play poker, or you know, do any of those other gamblings. But I'm not allowed to buy a loot box in the game. 
as an yes, adult. Uh, yes, including those that you cannot uh, actually cash out. It's uh, very interesting uh, that there is a sort of discrimination even between the various industries. And I know that the Belgian video gaming industry is not happy about this. Yeah, because it's ridiculous. Um, you know, I can see how it could be a, you know, unfortunate, you know, unhappy coincidence that this happened. But yeah, as, as you know, as just policy, as fair policy, right? This seems to be a deeply problematic, despite the fact that I really like their definition of gambling, though I get your point earlier about how this could be very, very expansive. Um, okay, um, as far as, okay, so let's, uh, Let's let's move on now. Um, Can I just 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 put the point where like eighty two of them actually still had loot boxes in them? I don't think I actually managed to say that yet. Oh wait wait eighty two of what? Oh uh, yeah. So in Belgium, when I went and looked, um, of the one hundred oh. highest grossing games, eighty two of them actually had loot boxes still in them, and this is despite the ban technically being in effect. Oh, because I'm assuming that means that Belgium is not actually prosecuting anybody. Uh, yes, that 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 is the case. Um, so they threatened to prosecute anyone, but they didn't actually carry out uh, the threat uh, when the game companies continue to not comply. You know, I I can see like this whole thing is such a big challenge. You have a situation. I'm thinking of the United States, and of course, the United States hasn't really tried to to deal with this. But you know, we have uh, you know political leadership that barely understands modern technology to a, to a large degree and loot box are particularly are the kind of thing that I think to really understand right you really need familiarity with the medium uh, to not fall into a moral panic um, and then you need to kind of figure out this how to fit it in with your current existing laws. Uh, and what to do about the spectrum of activities that you've shown this really kind of opens up the claw machine and and all that. I'm dying to know if the claw machine is actually legislated for in the United States. Uh, it is something I'm now I'm, I'm I'm super interested in. Like we have a situation that really requires some practical solutions, and I'm wondering if do you see any practical solutions for the loot box situation? And and if you do, do you think it's best enacted by the game companies, by government, by some outside agency? Like, wh wh what would you recommend? Well, I, I, I think it's really interesting that, that you were talking about the United States, um, because our gambling, to my understanding, in the States um, is regulated under state law. So each state would actually have their own different gambling laws. Oh, um, Jesus. So right now <laughs> you have the funny situation where games are releasing a different version in Belgium to comply with the law, at least those companies that do actually want to comply or just not publishing in Belgium at all. Um, but if you actually have different states in the United States uh, starting to have different positions on loot boxes, then you actually need different state versions of games, which does not seem something that is really practical. So you might have the situation where uh, the companies would comply with the territory that has the strictest laws and just release that version to all the other territories just to be safe. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, you know, having these divergent approaches in different countries definitely increases the costs the companies must uh, expend uh, just to comply. You know, it, it's interesting because this definitely makes it seem that uh, if this is, now mind you, I mean, we're assuming this is a problem. Right. As we're yes. assuming that the concerns about loot boxes are legitimate. So it's interesting that this is kind of a starting point that if you're going to have a law, right, just takes into assumption. And maybe all the many countries that have decided to do nothing about this have come to the conclusion of, look, this isn't really a problem we need to address. Right. Um, but for our, for this, let, let's just assume that there really is a problem that needs to be addressed. It seems that all of these situations, and yes, wow, the nightmare of the United States, uh, you know, having to deal with this, that seems to really kind of push it so if that there is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, platforms seem to me then would be the ideal place, a much better place to solve this problem than maybe governments. Are they? Well, there are definitely some advantages to having a platform regulation uh, in the sense that uh, we would 
I think, reasonably expect the platforms with more expert knowledge about video games than the governments do. So perhaps Apple will understand and, and be able to more easily identify a loot box as compared to the gambling regulator of, of a certain country. Um, but I, I, I am also concerned about this platform regulation kind of situation because, um, firstly, the, these platforms are conflicted. Uh, Apple, for example, takes about 30% on average from each transaction that you make right. uh, yep. on the App Store. So it is profiting 30% from each loot box that is bought. Now, if we are to, for example, believe that uh, probability disclosures reduce how much uh, people spend, and we have evidence suggesting that's it doesn't actually affect people all that much. Assuming that it does reduce spending, you know, uh, Apple would be uh, in a position where it's conflicted from enforcing its own rules because right. if it actually doesn't uh, ensure that there are probability disclosures, it makes more money. So these platforms are firstly conflicted. And then secondly, I, I also have con some concerns about giving power uh, to private entities. At the end of the day, uh, these are commercial entities uh, that, that are there for their own profit. You would also have some concerns about whether or not they would use the powers they will have uh, for um, anti-competition um, uh, concerns. For example, uh, will it, for example, use the loot box self-regulation or platform rules that it has, would it enforce it more strictly against its competitors as compared to its own games? For example, th this might be more relevant, mm. for example, to uh, Nintendo. Well, Nintendo doesn't really uh, publish games with loot boxes generally, but l l let's say Nintendo did. Perhaps it would be like softer on its own games with loot boxes as compared to uh, games uh, by other companies that, that also want to get on its platforms, uh, but with loot boxes in. Right. So, so the entire, uh, you know, uh, conflict of self, you know, conf conflict of interest issue is, is a big issue here. Um, any other possibilities, you know, like, uh, um, uh, industry regulation by industry bodies is another kind of possibility that happens in other, uh, in other industries. Um, is that more practical, you know, in, in this case? See, the, uh, the UK government uh, has very recently decided that in the UK, uh, it wants uh, loot boxes to be regulated for now uh, by industry self-regulation. It's asking the industry now to come up with a good plan as to how you're going to better protect consumers. So the UK government at least thinks that this is an approach uh, that is appropriate at this stage. So it, it doesn't want to expand the law and, and make the uh, the UK gambling regulator uh, suddenly have a lot more work to do that it probably doesn't have the resources to do. And on the other hand, it can take advantage of um, the, the industry knowledge uh, that the industry has. But I, I, I think we, we need to treat industry self-regulation with a, a reasonable degree of skepticism because at the end of the day, the industry is somewhat conflicted from acting against its own commercial interests. Now, I think they will probably do something that will uh, be a bit helpful, um, but I, I, I am not sure whether they, they are really invested in very uh, restrictive measures. Um, it's also, you know, it's, it's also really easy. So industry self-regulation can be really great for everybody uh, because the government doesn't have to, you know, pass laws and it doesn't have to essentially uh, make sure those laws are actually followed. And that saves money for them. You know, it it helps consumers, uh, and the uh, and the industry doesn't need to constantly worry about government watchdogs who are making sure that you know uh, that they're meeting the law. And that seems to have worked fairly well with things like the ESRB ratings or the uh, IPEG ratings. Um, but in those cases, um, you know. The industry didn't really lose anything, and in fact, it gained things by having labels, right? Because it gained player trust, right? Uh, it gained parents' trust, right? So, and it's following here in the steps of the film industry anyway. So it, you know, but here you're asking them to literally, like, you know, take a huge source of income <laughs> and try to make it, try to force companies. I mean, you know, I don't know how you can force all these companies because the industry doesn't have any power over uh, a company that decides, no, nah, screw that. The best they can do is give a certification that this is meets, you know, their standards. And that's about it. Well, it's true. It's just 
Uh, what, what you say, so with industry self-regulation, the concern is that there is not enough uh, enforcement powers so that uh, whichever industry body decides to uh, come up with an industry self-regulation plan, uh, the other companies are not going to follow it. Um, but I, I, I think these are, these are problems that could potentially uh, be solved, at least in a UK law context. So it is... It, it, so under existing consumer protection law, if you say that you are a signatory to a certain code of conduct, which the self-regulation might be, and you then do not follow that code of conduct, you are breaking the law. It, that is a crime that you can oh, be prosecuted for. So really? it is possible to sort of combine industry self-regulation with some sort of legal enforcement mechanism. It is possible to do this. I, I'm not sure about the situation in the US, but in the UK and in, in the EU, this is possible. You, you, you've, you've looked at some of the ways that uh, governments have tried to deal with this. And again, we're assuming that there's a problem. I'm, I'm curious whether you yourself think that... Uh, loot boxes are problematic or uh, whether some forms of loot boxes are problematic or others are not. Right. Um, uh, well, the thing is, I, I, I think we, we cannot deny that there are players out there who are uh, individuals who are at risk of harm and who are probably experiencing harm. We, ha we had some of these people come out to talk about their experience. Now, these people definitely do exist. Um, but but I, I think we're to look at this issue more broadly in terms of what percentage of all players are suffering harm from loot boxes, I, I think we are looking at a rather small percentage. Now, uh, this is not to deny that individuals will experience harm as a result of engaging with loot boxes. But uh, we, we, I, I think as it stands, we know from uh, research on free-to-play games, etc., that most players don't actually spend a penny on, on on video games that are free to play, and so a lot of players do indeed not buy loot boxes at all. So they're not really in the uh, at, at risk of suffering harm because they don't really engage with it. And, you know, they they might get, uh, get the free loot boxes by playing the game, but they're not going to buy any, and that's quite a lot of players. And I think there are also a lot of players who are able to engage with loot boxes in a way that is not uh, going to affect uh, their their life in other ways. You know, we we spend quite a lot of money on other hobbies besides video games. Uh, in, in any case, lots of people do, and I I I, I think if we really closely examine um, the, the survey data that we had of players self-reporting their spending, most of them are not really spending that much. Uh, or or I, I would say they're, they're not spending enough for it to be very concerning. Do you, do you have a way to kind of a compare this to traditional gambling where, you know, I mean, uh, my sister lives in Las Vegas, you know, I go to Vegas and I don't gamble, though I've gambled you know, uh, be, be before, um, I benefit, I guess, from all the stuff in the hotels that is paid for by the gambling. Uh, plenty of people go in, they gamble, they go out. But of course, there's also problem gambling. Is there a, you know, is, is there a difference, do you think, in what actually happens? Well, I, I, the, the, the main difference that, that strikes me is that, so, the, 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 the gambling market, or, or rather the, the gambling business model, it, it is built on players losing money. Casinos earn money when a player loses money. That's just how it works. It, 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 if the players do not lose, the, the casino cannot get money. But I, I think it's different in, in, in the loot box context. Every time a loot box is sold, the, uh, the, the company earns money. Now, if the player got their rare item early, then perhaps the company earns less. But the company would never actively lose money by selling loot boxes. Every loot box that is sold is profitable, albeit perhaps less profitable if the, the, the player got what they wanted uh, early. So so I, th I think this is, and this kind of goes back to what we can do about loot boxes is you cannot redesign gambling such that the activity becomes less harmful, but you can design loot boxes so that it is less harmful. Mm, interesting. Uh, notice a, a big part of it is if we're talking about gambling and the value is money uh, for both sides, then that, that seems a lot clearer than if uh, I'm buying a loot box and the value is, you know, fun. 
Mm. <laughs> right? Or the value is, well, I didn't get exactly what I wanted, but I got something that's pretty decent. And, you know, pretty decent is subjective. <laughs> you know, and and so the element of subjectivity here is just so big um, that uh, maybe that is a pretty big difference in terms of how we compare the value of uh uh, of these two things. Leon, let, let me ask you a final question. Um, what do you want to live our listeners with in terms of any of this stuff? From, from our experience, looking at uh, various efforts to address loot box harms, whether it's by law and regulation or it's by industry efforts, I think what we've found for sure is that we, we definitely need to continually monitor whether or not they have been effective, whether or not companies have complied. Uh, you know, what I have done is actually just to look at, at a very plain level whether or not companies have complied. I don't actually know whether or not, for example, probability disclosures are actually helpful. I, I don't actually know whether or not Belgian players have uh, played less games or, or bought fewer loot boxes because of the ban. I, I don't actually know those things. But what is important is we, we, we can't treat just one country having said that it's done something as a solution. It, it, it is probably not. And we need to continually uh, assess the situation and update whatever we decide to do about loot boxes, whatever that may be. We, we, we need to uh, think about how we can do better. I, 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 you know, there, there, there are going to be new developments with loot boxes as well. Uh, and, and we are seeing uh, many companies moving away from loot boxes and into other monetization mechanics. Uh, are those potentially also potentially harmful? For example, uh, I, I have heard some suggestions that uh, season passes, which are now present in a lot of games, those might be potentially harmful because those um, after you buy it, you are rather obliged to continue playing and investing a certain amount of hours into that game just so that you will get everything that you already paid for sort of as part of buying the season pass because you need to keep playing the game to uh, progress through the season pass um but but yes just we need to continually monitor uh, the, the the actions that we do take all right uh leon Shao, uh thank you so much man uh great to have you on the show uh play nice everybody you can subscribe and listen to all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.